I'm wearing one of my favorite Guayaveras today. And that, and by the way, Michael, is that the correct pronunciation? I've I've heard Guayabera, Guayavera. <laughs> How do you pronounce that correctly? So in Spanish, actually, V's and B's sound almost exactly the same. A V, you don't really say V, you say kind of B. So it's it's uh it's technically with a with a V, I a believe. Little B-ish. Guaya yeah. Guayavera, it, it it's with a V, but in Spanish it sounds like a B, so it's Guayavera. That's what I okay. Well anyway, I'm wearing one of my favorite Guayaveras today. It's a good look. But next week I'm wearing my all time favorite, my Fiesta Guayavera. No way. Yep. And Don, get, so the reason I'm doing that is starting on April 20th, we have Niosa. We have the River Parade, the Battle of Five Hours Parade. Oh. And we have all Fiesta Week. Don, do you know what Niosa is? I just know that 420 is National Marijuana Day. Uh, well, <laughs> no, we're, we're talking more like margaritas and beers, cervezas. Fiesta. Cervezas. Um, but Niosa is Night Knoll San Antonio. And they have that down in La Vita, down in the old, old, old part of San Antonio, probably older than St. Augustine, Florida. Yeah. A lot of people know it's not. Older Saint, than Saint, Saint Augustine, <laughs> Florida is the oldest city in the country, but there's been no, some debate. Yeah. There, hang on, hang on, let me finish. Years. There, there's been some debate that some of the Spaniards came up through Mexico and came up the rivers and had some little establishments. Uh, that were there, little outposts and and missions that were actually predate St. Augustine. I'm just saying. Does that, that mean you're going to start calling me Bandon Board? <laughs> the the V is with a B. I like that. Yeah, Don Bandon hey, Board. By, by the way, Dan, Dan, I gave you I gave you some fake news. Actually, it's uh it's with a B, not a V. So it's Guayabera. Oh. Guayabera. Okay, I, I like that. Don's got. <laughs> Uh, uh, anyway, Don Bandon board. I like that. I like Perfect. that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, so yes. So next week I'm wearing my wild guayabera that's got all kinds of colors and eggs and is perfect for Fiesta and Easter both. Yeah, wait. But but it is and and unfortunately I won't be down there next. But it's San Antonio like shuts down yeah. for a whole week. It's just one. It's kind of like um, Mardi Gras um, in New Orleans. And they have King Antonio, and that was for years. And then uh, in the 70s, they started King Ray Feo, which was like the ugly king, and he was more the Hispanic king, right? And so he was he came out. And anyway, it's it's just a good time. It's a good time. It, it's a lot of fun. But anyway, so I just wanted to bring that up. And and uh, my brother's in all those events. He's going to have to be doing a lot of stuff. So maybe I will sneak down there yeah, yeah. for a couple of days. But, folks, if you've never been, it's a lot of fun. It really like a is. a day trip over there. Yeah, it, is, it, it does get pretty crowded, though, so make sure you have plans. Yeah. All right. All right. So enough about that. Let's. Talk, so we're going to talk about planning, uh, uh, Social Security, pensions, 401Ks, and what to do. I'll give you a quick example. Um, um, and Social Security, uh, uh, are they going to run out of benefits? How do you collect them? Look, I posted an article. A lot. There's a few articles on the show notes. I don't want to grind the show to a stop, but there's a there's an article about Social Security. If you want to read that, for our Revere clients, we handle all that for you. We look at your Social Security benefits, and we actually have an outside consultant that all she does is Social Security benefits. That's all she does. So if you need help with that, but the last thing I want to do is. Uh, 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 d- 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 bring the show to a halt. And now, um, yet red, yellow, and green are your normal stoplights, but they're going to come out with a fourth color, potentially, a white stoplight. Because artificial intelligence, AI, self-driving cars, they're so smart, they need a fourth light. That can, red, yellow, and green aren't enough. I thought they were supposed to be smarter than humans, right? <laughs> they, so anyway, there's an article about. It's actually a very interesting article. It gets kind of in depth, but it's you, talking you gotta, about. You got to summarize. You got to summarize that. Why does it need white? What is? Uh, what is uh, well, so about? they. Well, I, I, I'll dive into that in a second. I, I, I was going to bring that up quickly, though. I want to talk about. Um, um, 
Um, the Social Security is, is too complex. So just call me if you need help with the planning because it, 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 with the husband and wife, it can get very tricky. And uh, sometimes you collect on one and not the other. But I want to talk about planning now, especially for self-employed individuals. So a lot of people, a lot of companies, they, they, they have S corporations and where they get a W-2 and they pay themselves some money. And then they also get the passive S corp dividend, the passive income. And what a lot of people have done for years and years and years is they paid themselves a very low W-2 income. They kind of sandbagged their W-2 income and paid themselves a lot of uh, S corp income. Well, when they do that, they avoid the social security and Medicaid tax. So they avoid that 15.3. The problem is the IRS is really beefing it up and they've been making this promise for 20 years, but now they're really, and apparently they've got an AI system, ironically, a, 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 a algorithm that they're going to look at the ratio between those. But look, if you're a professional, if you're a dentist or a doctor or a lawyer, whatever, and you're making four or $500,000 a year, it's not reasonable for you to pay yourself 40 or 50 or 60 and then pay the other 450 as passive income. I mean, think about it. How much work in somebody's mouth when you're removing teeth or how much legal work or how much medical crack did you do to make that? Or in other words, what you're saying is 50,000 of that was made through actually doing the work and 450,000 was passive just being an owner of the company. Is that reasonable? But, but here's the other thing. On the flip side, people that have small companies that are self-employed, they can do all kinds of very cool 401k ERISA pension plan and even defined benefit plans. You can customize a plan where you can put lots of money in. Most big companies, they do the 401k with the 12 mutual fund choices and that's it. But there are other options. So a guy came in to me just a, a week or two ago. He's making five, making a lot of money, over half a million dollars a year, and he was and he was griping about how much tax he had to pay, and he was still trying to do a SEP. Well, a SEP you can only do twenty percent of your salary after you back out your self employment portion if you're the owner. Well, here's the other problem with that SEP. It's based on your W two income. You can't base it on the half a million. It's only that W two portion, that fifty or whatever you pay yourself. Or is these self these 401ks you can do 22 5 or even 30 if you're over 50 30,000 as long as you have that much in earned income so the SEPs are really older plans they're not really used that much anymore because the new 401k styles are much easier much more flexible and they're just a lot better but then you can actually do a defined benefit plan on top of that if the demographics look right in any event we were able to show this guy how he could actually make a over a $200,000 contribution in a defined benefit plan, a pension plan for him later on. And so it's going to save him, you know, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 in taxes. So it depends on how your business is structured and what you're doing. But if you've got the right type of setup, you can really uh, save a lot of money uh, in tax deferred vehicles and lower your taxes. All right. If you, you want to be a C Corp for that, Dan. You can be a C corp, an S corp, a partnership. No, it's you can be an S corp. Okay. It, yeah, but but it's it's the 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 trick is for for when you're counting pension contributions or four hundred one k contributions, it's got to be the earned income. Uh, so in an S corp, the passive dividend portion doesn't count. It's only the W two portion you pay employees and owners. Okay. Now for a C corp, like Don, you and I, we're a C corp. OK, that it counts the whole profit of the company, not just what you and I pay each other on W-2 income well, for the prop for the company, Matt, for the matching and for the uh, profit sharing or the defined. It's different. So it depends on which type of plan and what you're talking about. And that's why it gets very tricky. But if you've got someone that really knows ERISA plans, I mean, it it the amount of money you're making and how you're structured and your demographics, your employees is crucial for the right kind of plan for you. One size fits all is not the case. Okay. So you come to me, I look at your stuff. You show me how you're structured. You show me how, what your cash flow is and how much you could save and how much you could put away. And then we can figure out if we can actually do that or even more. Or, and that actually, when you get the tax deduction, it increases your cash flow because now you're not paying as much in tax. In other words, even though you're making a contribution to the a defined benefit or the pension plan or the 401k plan, 
really two thirds of that, one third of that, the government's kind of poning up for you. Cause if you don't make it, you're going to pay a third in just a couple months to the government anyway. So it's, it's not as, it's a lot more palatable. It's a lot better. And uh, I can talk about any of that. Okay. Now, so I am going to very quickly go over this very quickly. This article, it says, Don, it's talking about the wild hack. This is the title of the article, the wild hack that could pave the way for self-driving. Now, this guy is Ali Hajababaye, is a civil, I'm probably just butchered that. He's a, a mm-hmm. civil engineer at North Carolina State University, and he's envisioning, he says, this white traffic light means robots go, humans follow. So he wants the humans to kind of take the back seat a little bit, and apparently the humans, I mean, the, the robots are more efficient, and they can kind of set the pace. Um, um, and basically, he said the problem um, aren't the self-driving cars. It's not their fault they crash into police cars, uh, manifest weird flocking behaviors, that's the humans, or go on strike. The whole point is this guy wants uh, uh, all automation. He doesn't really want you driving anyway. Um, but there is a lot more um, problems with uh, combining self-driving cars with the imperfect humans. It's a lot more involved than you think, and it's probably a little further down the road than you might think because of trying to merge the two systems. And they they are kind of all coming to the realization that they need a little bit more of the smart car, I don't, I don't know how you say it, um, sensors, roads, whatever, so that the smart cars can ha- have more uh, uh, points to in which to, re- you know, to read where they are in time and space. It's an interesting article. Anyway, um, I just thought it was funny. It caught my eye because it was saying that self-driving cars, artificial intelligence, actually needs an extra stoplight. Um, now, instead of the mailbag, I actually found this poem that is actually by uh, uh, chat GPT four. So oh, this right. is actually a chat, a smart AI poem that it made up and it's talking about the bank failures. And I just thought it tied in with uh, Buffett says more bank failures are, are likely. I've also posted that article. He gives a few different reasons, slowing economy, higher rates, you know, et cetera. Um, we've already talked about that the last few shows. You can go, uh, look at that. All right. Here is, here is this poem. I love this. In the tale of banks and securities unbound, a warning for shareholders. Now we expound. For HTM securities, stable and steady, can still bring risk for which to be ready. As interest rates and bond prices, dis- as interest rates rise and bond prices descend, their hidden losses start to portend. Banks feel the pressure, capital wanes. Liquidity tightens, uncertainty reigns. That's a great paragraph right there. Uh, should banks falter and the crisis unfold, shareholders witness their fortunes untold. With capital shrinking and losses now real, their stock prices suffer a heartbreaking ordeal. The value they held once soaring high now plummet to earth as investors sigh. Dividers, dividends vanish, the future unclear. The once promised banks now shrouded in fear. So shareholders listen and take heed of this rhyme. In a world of finance, there's dangers to find. Though HTM securities appear safe and sound, their hidden risk can still bring a bank down. Now, this is just recently in the last week or two when all this fear is going around. And actually, it's kind of funny because this is exactly what we want to see. We want to see a lot of fear, a lot of articles. We want to see this kind of capitulation in the market. So you finally get all the people that are scared out. And once all the people that we're going to sell, sell have sold, that's when you can really establish a, a new uptrend. But with that, what we really want is we want to go to uh, Team Revere. We want to talk about the stocks, bonds, the markets, and what is actually the market, the stock market and the bond market actually telling us, because it actually just might surprise you. So, Don, take it over. I want, 
Well, I want to start out by saying with every fiber of my being, I will never allow another AI generated poem to be read on our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. It was, all right. it was yeah, iambic that... pentameter. I mean, <laughs> just, just so just so you know, as long as it wasn't haiku, that then it wouldn't <laughs> rhyme. That would have been Ooh, even worse. Listen, that was not run by me for approval. I have no. Well, that's because you would have said Dan no. Does on on his portion of the show, but I promise you, I will start saying la 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 <laughs> if Dan ever starts reading another AI generated poem on the podcast. Mark that down. Eleven a.m. Eastern Time, April fourteenth. Now, let's go to the markets and uh, quite an eventful week it has been uh so let's let's step back into uh the end of last week uh and we ended up on a thursday we were closed for friday the markets and i'm talking about the s p 500 were gently pulling back uh from recent highs after uh, a nice follow-through day that happened on 329 this was a this was a gap up uh, and a higher close over 1%, 1.42, in fact, uh, on higher volume. Thursday, we had another high. We followed through with another follow-through day on 331. We got a little bit ahead of ourselves. We even had a higher close on 4.3 on the S&P 500. This put us 3% above the 21-day moving average. That's a little stretched for the short term. So we started to pull back. The pullbacks uh, were fine on the indexes, but they were painful, more painful for leading stocks as there was some rotation going on when uh, negative uh, economic data started coming out and the market started to act like it was very concerned about inflation. So money started coming out of tech, uh, coming out of industrials uh, and moving to staples, utilities and healthcare. So we bounced right where we needed to at the 21 day moving average. And uh, the, the week opened with an up day, then a consolidation day. And basically we were just waiting for what was gonna happen with CPI on Wednesday morning. So this is the consumer measure of inflation. And the data came out uh, what is referred to as cool, which means inflation was below what they were expecting. And the initial reaction was a big gap up pre-market. I'm going to a five minute chart here uh, on the S&P 500. So a big gap up, but that we, we reached our highs within the first 15 minutes, started pulling back, had a harsh pullback, uh, but then a strong bounce. And everybody was like, ah, it's nothing. Uh, we're gonna go off to the races, but no, we had, uh, some data that came out in the afternoon, the Fed minutes, and the Fed was not looking so dovish. And we had a harsh sell-off into the close. This was Wednesday. Uh, so it was looking like a failed breakout above this uh, 41.23 level with the CPI gap up. So fast forward to the next day, PPI data was coming out, and that's not normally considered uh, as impactful as consumer data, consumer inflation data, because obviously that's what the consumer's paying. Producers have an option of whether or not they want to pass their increased costs on to consumers. But the PPI data was, was a huge miss, meaning it was uh, disinflationary relative to what the expectations were. So we basically did an, a, a complete 180 and what people were expecting with the cooler CPI data on Wednesday, we actually got instead on Thursday, which was a minor gap up, but then a strong move, a trend up day, all the way higher throughout uh, the entire day. So with the PPI, strong update, what we thought we were gonna get on Wednesday, we ended up getting on Thursday. And this is, this is really just indicative of the type of market that we've been seeing. When you think it's gonna zig, it zags and vice versa. So, uh, by the close on Thursday, we had a breakout above this 41.33 level. Now it would be completely normal uh, to pull back to around this 41.30 level. Uh, and what we're seeing on Friday so far was a little bit of morning strength, but of course you would think that that's gonna follow through to the upside. It didn't, the market reversed, but all we're doing is pulling back to this 41.30 area. So. Uh, no harm done so far. We can even pull back to 41.20-ish 
and uh, that would still be healthy. Now, if we go below the lows of uh, PPI, uh, CPI day on Wednesday, that's where things uh, start to get dicey. So the key level that we're watching uh, is a break back below uh, Wednesday's lows. We've got a little bit of room below there because really 4070 is the key area that we've been watching, uh, 4070 to 4080. But so far, uh, a normal pullback uh, today on Friday on the S&P 500. But what I really want to talk about is there's been so much negativity uh, on uh, regarding to the markets. It really peaked two weeks ago. Things have gotten a little bit more bullish over the last two weeks. But the bottom line is I'm, I'm showing a chart here. It's something we started. It's called the Titan 25. These 25 stocks are really the bellwethers for the three big cap indexes because what we've been seeing is strength in the big caps, uh, but some pretty weak action in mid caps and small caps, all tied to that uh, banking liquidity crisis. So, and they still really haven't recovered. Mid, -cap, mid caps have a little bit. Uh, we're still down quite a bit on small caps. But these 25 stocks, as long as these continue to hold up above their key moving averages, and this is showing the 21 day and the 50 day, uh, at worst case, we're, we're taking a look at the 50 day. As long as these 25 stocks continue to act fine, the markets, from a big cap standpoint anyway, uh, can't break down. Now, we're a primarily uh, mid cap and smaller large cap growth company. Those haven't been working. We've been having success with our uh, index longs. The leaders have really kind of just been churning, maybe going up two, three, four percent, and then in two days they'll pull back two, three, four percent, kind of riding their 21 day. Not a lot of turnover, uh, but not a lot of strength either. In a very strong bullish market, you'll see growth stocks outperforming the market by a factor of two to two and a half to three. Uh, but we haven't been having much success at all uh, with those types. There's been, a, there's been a couple where we've gotten outsized returns versus the indexes, but for the most part, uh, they're breaking down, recovering, and uh, a lot of churn going on with those type of stocks. So this is why we're, we've been focusing more on the big cap indexes and these 25 stocks that have a massive impact on the indexes. So we've got 13, a total of 25, 13 of these are in the S&P 500. They make up a third of the S&P 500. 12 of them make up 60% of the NASDAQ 100, and 12 of them make up 61% uh, of the Dow. And it's not all tech stocks. There's a strong variety of sectors here. Uh, 16 different sectors uh, comprise these 25 stocks, and it, there's quite a variety. Uh, banks, retail, medical, finance, aerospace, machinery, software, uh, energy, consumer, chips, uh, software, internet, a broad variety. So we're going to update this. I'm going to have uh, Titan 25 Tuesday where I'll be updating the returns of all these. And these are going to give us a very clear indicator as to whether or not the market's going to roll over. Because if certain sectors within this 16 start to roll over, it'll drag us down. But you know what I always say about the S&P 500, all rotation occurs uh, within the S&P 500. So if money comes out of either growth or value to one or the other or certain sectors to other sectors, it all happens within the S&P 500. And that's why it's so difficult to beat the S&P 500. It's hard to stay a step ahead of the sector rotation, but by sticking with the broad index, we have a 60% allocation uh, to the S&P 500 using leveraged ETFs. Uh, this will help us keep a close eye on whether the market is strengthening or weakening. So far, it's just a normal pullback to the 4130-ish area after a breakout on Thursday. And the market's not bearish. These stats are not bearish. The fact that they're above their 21 and their 50-day average is not bearish. So stop worrying until these stocks break down, and we'll start commenting on it. Certainly, the deep dive will be every Tuesday, but every day of the week, if something significant happens to one of these, uh, we'll talk about it. So keep watching the videos. I've had a lot of people uh, write in and say they pretty much quit watching other videos because they like to cover uh, broad market indexes uh, and all of the inter asset correlation, whether it's Bitcoin, gold, bonds, um, and 
I think we do a good job of keeping our finger on the pulse of everything that's important. Sentiment is another thing. The VIX, uh, stochastics, growth stocks, big cap stocks. So stick with us. We'll keep you on the right side of the market. And for now, our focus is on the big cap indexes because that's what's working. There are a few stocks that just continue to just grind higher. Uh, but, you know, two, three or four stocks, if you were lucky enough to get into them, hats off to you. Uh, but for the most part, leading stocks are acting okay, but not acting great. Uh, so our focus for now is on these big cap indexes, and then we'll keep an eye to see if mid cap and small cap can repair themselves. And if they do, then we can step a little deeper into, uh, into that pool where we're really so fond of fishing, but uh, when there's no bites, you got to move to a different pond, and that's really where we are right now. I'm sure Dan wants to clean that up for uh, put his Don Turpiter on. Actually, you did pretty well on that. That was actually I like that, Don. You, you well, Dan, you're making me blush now. Well, you, yeah, you you kept it very simple and in plain language. I mean, you, you threw out a few big words there, like stochastics, but everything else was pretty good. Well, let's hear one for Bandon Board then, huh? There you go. Bandon Board. <laughs> Bandon Board. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's accentuate some of the, the rest of this fantastic team we've uh, assembled here, Dan. Let's go to Michael. And uh, Mike, what are you going to talk about this week? Yeah, that, that, that was a great uh, segment, Don. I really enjoy, enjoyed listening to that. Um, great, great info. Um, so I want to talk about three um, three stocks, and I'll briefly um, go into the um, the bull case, and um, and then we'll we'll pull up the charts. Uh, the the first one is TMUS T-Mobile. Uh, I'm sure most people are pretty familiar with uh, T-Mobile communication services company um, under the T-Mobile and Metro PCS brands. And um, what I'm looking at on these is if you go to the um, to either the weekly or the monthly chart. Um, they're they're setting up these names are setting up for some some long term um, big breakouts if if the market um, cooperates and the bull case for T Mobile is that um, it's got the wind at its back post merger with Sprint it's got a great reputation uh, with customers and it delivers better service than other carriers and the uh, the end factor in this um, which is the the new product new service uh, something new about it that can really um, the catalyst to push it higher is that they are now taking coverage above and beyond with SpaceX, um, and this new service is is connecting uh, the vast majority of smartphones on T-Mobile's network to Starlink satellites, which is um, SpaceX is one of Elon Musk's companies, and um, and yeah, that that could be the um, the catalyst now to um, to really propel T-Mobile to the to the next level. But on the chart. Um, waiting for the relative strength to confirm this move but um it's got some nice volume here um last five weeks um green volume those blue bars and um yeah it's forming a, a nice little base here and um i'd like to see it uh push higher so that's one to keep on the radar then another one is um mike, lmt yeah like that's in the titan 25 did you know that i did yeah it yep. is number uh, 12 holding in the NASDAQ 100. Mm. Yeah. And then um, the next one is LMT, um, Lockheed Martin. They are the largest U.S. defense contractor. They're involved in, in pretty much everything um, defense related. And um, what's good about defense contractors is that um, they, they operate in a pretty, um, in an acyclical business, which means that they can do well regardless of what the economy is doing. So even if we enter a recession, there's still defense spending. It's, it's one of the largest parts of the, um, the, the budget. So you can expect um, the U.S. is always going to spend on military. And the, um, I guess, kind of an end in this situation, but just um, a, a catalyst is geopolitics. Um, I mean, geopolitical tensions are super heightened at the moment. Um, and the U.S., um, spends obviously they're going to spend more on their defense budget um in relation to um geopolitical conflicts so um the way we like to or the u.s likes to run its uh its military strategy is more and of deterrence so it's it's um it's peace by strength and um yeah it 
it, 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 we, we like to really spend a lot in our military so that we don't have to use it. Um, so if you go to the monthly chart on that as well, um, it's just been coiling and setting up for, for a big um, long-term move. And then the, um, the last name is VRTX, Vertex, um, which is actually in the midst of a breakout. So we'll see if that can continue. Um, and Vertex is a biotech company that discovers, develops, um, and commercializes medicines for serious diseases. Um, their current treatments are primarily focused on, on cystic fibrosis, but their platform, um, they, they've partnered and basically uh, they're able to apply that. At the moment, it's mainly on cystic fibrosis, but they plan to expand that and to use it for, um, for all sorts of serious diseases. Um, and they're on pace to have another record year after last year's uh, record year. Um, earnings keep growing, revenues keep growing. And what's good about uh, biotech, specifically um, these larger cap ones, is that just like defense stocks, medical stocks are acyclical, can do well in almost any economic environment. So it's um, you've got you've got the factor that um, investors do sort of see them as safe haven, defensive type plays. But then you've also got the growth and the um, the, the real um, optionality of, of the, these types of companies. So that's one to um, to keep track of as well. Fantastic, you know. And and looking at these weekly charts, I want to remind everybody that we uh, Wednesdays on the video is going to be weekly chart Wednesday, where we take a step back and look at a little longer term view. I have a uh, not sure it's the best habit of focusing on daily charts and sometimes get shaken out on things when if you look at a weekly chart, you can see it's a perfectly normal reaction. And you can especially see how the weekly volume uh, is being impacted and pullbacks on light volume are uh, nothing to be concerned about. So always looking for constant improvement at Revere and uh, Titan 25 Tuesday and weekly chart Wednesday. Look forward to it. Learn it. Love it. Live it. And love next it. up is Connor. Connor's got three uh, three names he wants to take us through too. Yeah, so I got three names today that I like. Uh, these aren't mega cap names. I thought Don did a good job of explaining the strength in these mega caps that we've been seeing. Um, and those have definitely been some of the best names to own this year it, it seems like they've been the flight to quality names and and big institutions have been get uh have been getting behind them um but i still think you can find some some smaller cap names mid cap names that are acting well so the first name i wanted to mention is onon this one mentioned it before but it's been doing everything you want a stock to do after it gaps up on earnings if you look at the volume three consecutive days of huge volume after it gapped up on a positive earnings and when the market was pulling back this name pulled back as well but it never breached the 21 day moving average and if you look at the volume while it was pulling back it was kind of going sideways and and pulling back on decreasing volume and a lot of times that can act as a launch pad um, if it looks good because when volume comes in, it, it can pop right back up. And we're seeing a little bit of that today. Um, and then if you just go to the weekly chart, Don, some of these, these newer IPO names, when they can be good buys, good early buys, when, when you look at this weekly chart, it, all that uh, volume and consolidation at the lows. And then when it comes out, um, it can really see a big move if the market starts to heat up. Um, and this name's got some great uh, fun ownership as well. Fidelity Contra Fund owns this stock and um, it definitely is seeing some institutional appetite. So one to keep on watch and one that personally, I love the shoes, the product, easy to understand and price actions acting really well. Um, next one is RMBS. We do own ONON, -O -N, by the way, um, added to it today. It's our second largest position. Yep. And then Rambus, um, this is another emerging name in the semiconductor space that's showing leadership qualities. And if you go to the weekly chart, this is what stood out to me a lot with this name is um, 
when you look at when you see that cup around 23 26 the overall market was in a downtrend and heading lower but this stock was bucking the trend and it was forming this nice cup and so when when the s p did kind of find a a bottom this thing was breaking out and from everything that i've studied leading stocks that that's a clear clear sign that the stock could be a leader i mean all the leading stocks are gonna um they're gonna just find their bottom before the index is bottom and usually when the indexes are bottoming they're going to be moving out into new high ground so when the mark when it gets the market wind behind its back those are when these names can really go um and it's just in it's in a it's in the great sector as well that's been showing rs all year so i really like this name as well and then the last name is algm just want to mention we do own rambus also that's right um algm again this is this one so it this is the first test of the 50-day moving average so when a stock breaks out of a sound base heads higher maybe it was a little extended it was struggling at the highs and now it's testing the 50-day moving average that's you know that's an o'neill rule that can be a good good entry if if you miss the boat you miss the breakout and you're looking to get back into a leader um a test of the 50-day moving average can be a great spot to add some exposure on a leading name. Um, I like this one as well. I mean, it's got good institutional backing, great earnings, the up-down volume ratio is fantastic. So, and it's in a leading sector, leading space. So yeah, these are uh, three names that I like. I mean, still there's a ton of mega caps like Don's been talking about that that look really good, but there are still some mid cap names setting up that look attractive here. So um, yeah, those three names I like a lot and we own them at Revere. Something back to ONON I wanna point out is a precedent. We're always looking for uh, charts or patterns that uh, we can refer to in the past because the behavior of those stocks is repeated over and over again. If you go back two years on um, Snapchat, go back to uh, uh, just pull up. Uh, gosh. So two years ago uh, on Snapchat, uh, we had. A uh, huge gap up, 1021, 2020, huge gap up, very similar and very similar to the volume, to the size of what we're seeing uh, in ONON. And this behavior over the next three weeks is almost by, by, bar by bar identical to what we're seeing now uh, in Snapchat, in ONON. So these stocks, you know, people get in, then they rush in, it'll have a failed breakout. It'll just go a little too far. Then it'll pull back. Some weak holders will get rid of it. It'll come down to the 21, which is where it should find its footing, find support, and then go on another run as long as the market, uh, is, uh, permitting it to. So look at those three to four weeks on Snapchat. Look at the current three to four weeks, uh, on ON, ON, and uh, they're really virtually identical. Uh, and hats off to somebody in our trader chat community who pointed this out uh, yesterday. Uh, good stuff here. And today the volume came in, it broke above after the recent uh, six, seven day pullback. Uh, we'll see if it can hold this breakout today with the market pulling back. It's definitely uh, bucking the market trend. Uh, back above that 30 area and particularly we wanted to add if it got above the highs of this pullback which is around 3066 and when it did this morning we added another one and a half percent size to it so we've got a four and a half percent uh position on this good job connor thanks and uh dan will send it back to you to wrap it up all right folks listen if you like what you heard please tell a friend tell a neighbor just send them to revere asset.com up in the right hand corner uh, there's a subscribe button they can put in their name and email address and they'll get this podcast delivered directly in their inbox normally on saturday morning but if you go to youtube and just uh, search revere asset just revere asset and hit subscribe as soon as zach posts this normally around noon central time 
uh, it'll be on YouTube. So you actually get it on Friday uh, midday before the markets even close if you really want it early. You'll also get our nightly uh, daily market insight videos uh, that Don does every evening the day uh, the, the, when the market is open. And it's all uh, research for your edification and uh, education. And it's some investment ideas. It's not meant to take any trades or anything. It's just for you to, to learn about. Uh, and if you got any questions, you can reach out to us if you want a, a, a complimentary portfolio review or just want some help or just have a stock idea or a tax or a state planning question. We do all the holistic planning. You can email any of us at dan at revereasset.com, don at revereasset.com, Michael, Connor, or Ted at revereasset.com. And we can all you can always call us old school at 855-REAL-WEALTH. Folks, have a safe and happy weekend, and we'll talk to you next week on Your Money. Because it's not how much you make in the markets, it's how much of that you can keep.